It's good. Welcome here. Good to see you. Uh, good to see all you beautiful people staring at us through the camera. I'll just to add my welcome to all the hosts who are welcoming you to the services. Uh, you are going to need your Bibles. We are in an Old Testament study, and tonight, uh, today, we are in uh, the book of Nehemiah. So you're going to need your, uh, uh, just to stick your thumb in Nehemiah chapter 8. It'll take us a while. We're going to get there, and we will read a chunk together. Uh, but as we get started, I want to just ask you a question to uh, get the... Uh, the mental juices start flowing. Don't a answer the question out loud. Uh, maybe in your mind, don't even immediately jump to a conclusion. Ponder the question, think it through, and uh, we'll come back around it uh, in a little bit of time. But if I were to ask you the question, can you be a flourishing Christian and not be part of a local church fellowship? How would you answer that question? Don't answer it out loud. Ponder it, think about it in your mind. Can you be a Christian, a flourishing Christian, and not be part of a local church fellowship? So uh, we are doing a series of messages, a topical series from the Old Testament, uh, simply calling it Rebuild, uh, on the themes of renewal and revival. So Tim Keller is a guy that uh, most of you will have heard us talk about very, very often, a pastor in New York City for over 30 years, uh, Redeemer uh, Church in uh, right on the, the island of Manhattan, and he has done a lot of writing, a lot of study, and writing particularly on the subject of historic renewals and revivals. And what Keller said he found in his studies, there are four discernible stages in every historic revival when you look back on them. Number one is that sleepy Christians wake up. The first thing to happen in a revival is that sleepy Christians wake up. Secondly, nominal Christians actually start getting saved, which is an amazing thing. The third thing is that the lost are evangelized and awakening begins to happen. And then finally, number four, the city, the region, the nation begins to experience transformation. And as you look back on the historic renewal and revival movements throughout the centuries, you will find all four of those stages in that discernible pattern that God begins with his people. So we're three weeks into this series uh, that we're simply calling Rebuild, taking a page out of Old Testament history and skipping through these four post-exilic books and looking at the themes of renewal and revival. And most critical is that take that revival, renewal always starts with God's own people. So the first weekend, we looked at a key verse that is going to come up again throughout the series, Second Chronicles 7.14, this challenge and this promise to the people of God long before they'd gone into exile, that if my people, if my people, notice the emphasis there, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, not the culture's wicked ways, but my people's wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So week one, we looked back on the 400 years prior, the prophecies about this time of great unraveling, this time of great spiritual darkness that was going to come on the nation of Israel, and the promise that we just read that if in those days of captivity, even in great spiritual decline and darkness, you call upon me, you humble yourself, you turn away from your sin, I will hear you in your captivity, I will answer your prayer. That was week number one. Uh, last week, we looked at the partnerships that uh, God uses in times of renewal and revival, and we, we put it this way, that when God sets out to renew his people, that he does it through gospel partnerships. And we talked about the fact that the hero in the first six chapters of the book of Ezra, when we began looking at this rebuilding, was not a priest or a pastor or a member of the clergy, but the hero was actually a developer, a builder, a guy named Zerubbabel, and that God uses these gospel partnerships to move the gospel forward. This week, we're going to jump into a very simple concept, a very, very basic concept that is woven throughout the story that when God sets out to renew his people, he takes them back to the basics. I mean, that is as simple as it gets. But we're going to grab that theme and look at that in these times of renewal and revival, it is always a renewal of really the basic, ordinary ways that God works in our lives. And it's, it's getting new life into the old basic activities, the, the rhythms of worship and prayer and gathering and scattering. Or if we were to use New Testament language, we would say he restores Christ and his church to the center of our daily lives. 
And so we would have to ask ourselves some questions. If a church in a local setting or in a nation or however you might look at it, if a church that was once flourishing and vibrant is no longer bearing fruit, it is no longer flourishing and vibrant, then we would have to ask ourselves the question, what happened, of course? Uh, like the analogy of a beautiful garden, and if a garden was once lush and fruitful, whether it was fruits and vegetables or just ornamental trees and flowers and the beauty of a garden, and then that garden was barren, you'd have to ask yourself what changed. Either the gardener forgot his or her skill, a new gardener came along who didn't know how to properly garden, or the climate had changed. The soil had changed. The conditions of that once flourishing garden had changed. And so as we look at the church in North America, we know that there was certainly a time in the past when the church was more central to our society at large than it is today. In fact, if you've traveled on the east side of our continent and traveled through the towns and villages and even the major cities up and down the east coast and and even largely into the Midwest you will see significant difference in the church buildings in those places being at the very center of the city. Uh, Early church and city founders would get together and laying out the plans for the first city streets and and the infrastructure and the buildings. And and more often than not, a, a city was built around a town square, a center, a park with a bandstand, a gathering place. It was long before the days of television and internet and media. And so the only way to get together was literally to get together. And so they would have a town plaza and a bandstand and a place to gather. And on one side certainly would be city hall or the lock courts or call it what you might, the seat of government. But guaranteed, if you looked across that plaza, on one or two or maybe three of the corners around that plaza would be what we today would call old historic churches. Nearly every city, even every small village and town would have a Baptist church, a Methodist church, an Episcopalian church, a Presbyterian church, and most often they would have prime real estate right there on the city plaza. The little villages would have a little country white church in the village, and in the city where they had a little more money, they might build a beautiful steeple and a bell tower, and Sunday morning the bells would ring out, inviting the neighborhood to come to work. Does anybody remember bell ringing in your lifetime at all? Let me tell you a story. I looked up online the first church that I could remember, and I actually found a picture. It still is standing. First Baptist church in a little 700-populated village called Arnold, Nebraska. My earliest church memory, and it's not much of a building, is it? But in that bell tower, there was a bell. And my earliest memories were going over there with my older brothers and sometimes my father to ring that bell on a Sunday morning. And the Methodist church was right across the street ringing their bell, And so it was a competition of the two church bells in this little village of 700. But church is no longer at the center of our culture. And increasingly, buildings, houses of worship, are not even part of the official city plan anymore. If you look at new developments, if you look at new subdivisions, if you look at anything that's happening in the city planning office, it's hard to find designations for religious institution in the plan's moving forward. So in the 2010 Olympics uh, in Vancouver, uh, many of you were in and watching them. We were living in the city at that time, and journalists from all over the world descended on Vancouver, and they were covering the games primarily, but a lot of them also gave commentary on the city of Vancouver and writing for their papers wherever they were from. And, and one guy from Philadelphia named Frank Fitz, Fitzpatrick wrote an interesting article, not on the Olympics, but he, the title was this, Keeping the Faith Question Mark Not in Vancouver. And the story, part of it, read like this. From Lionsgate Bridge, the city's downtown skyline, spectacularly framed by water, sky, and mountain, is itself a natural wonder. At night especially, beyond the great dark swath of Stanley Park on its western point, the glass and concrete skyscrapers, the residential tower clusters, and harbor center's circular top twinkle like a man-made constellation. But visitors who soak in that view more deeply might see, or rather not see, something else. Vancouver, on closer inspection, lacks a common feature of most other North American cityscapes, church steeples. 
Now, if you know Vancouver, the peninsula, that little thumb that sticks out in the water, you will know that there are literally about 10 church facilities on that peninsula. We do lack steeples. I remember in 2009 when we moved into the city up in the Mount Pleasant neighborhood, there was one very large steeple, and I thought, at least there's one great church in this neighborhood, and we're out for a walk, and I'm like, I want to go see what church that is, just off of 10th Street. So we walk up to it, and it is a beautiful old Presbyterian building, but lo and behold, it's been turned into luxury lofts and apartments. No church meets in that building anymore. He quoted a prophet regent who said this, the kind of people drawn to BC tend to be more interested in the outdoors and cuisine rather than theological matters. What do they need churches for? Sushi trumps the sacraments here. So where there were once church fellowships vibrant in neighborhood by neighborhood, they are vastly, vastly dis- diminished and closed. And the question that we're asking is, can Christ and his church be returned to the center again? So last week we looked at Zerubbabel and the temple rebuilding, and now 60 years later, a preacher named Ezra shows up and begins in earnest the work of the spiritual renewal of the people. The temple has been built, the daily sacrifices are being offered, the annual feasts and festivals are being celebrated, and God is indeed restoring the spiritual rhythms of his people. However, the city itself is still largely unpopulated because the walls are still just a pile of rubble. So fast forward another dozen years, and a guy named Nehemiah shows up. And Nehemiah comes to rebuild the walls, and actually we'll talk a little bit about that next week. We're doing these out of order. The largest volunteer mobilization in biblical history, Nehemiah 3. Just read it. Next to him, next to him, next to him, next to him, next to him. It's like a list of 100 and some names long. It's like a great Amish barn raising party. The walls are miraculously rebuilt in just 52 days. And when the walls are complete, the people pour into the city from the surrounding towns and villages, and they gather for a great worship celebration, and the Spirit of God does a good work among them. So we're going to read the first uh, eight verses from Nehemiah chapter 8. And it reads like this, And all the people were gathered as one man into the square before the water gate, And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for that purpose. Now, if you're following along, there's a a, a verse full of names that we can't pronounce, so just jump down to verse 5. All these men, and then Ezra opened the book, and in the sight of all the people, for he was above the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And then another list of long names we can't pronounce. And the Levites helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. So I've read that passage many, many times over the years, particularly in the, through the year of a Bible program. You just come through it every year. And I have often wondered what it would have been like to be with those people on that day. And if you could time travel back in your mind, they've settled in the towns and villages surrounding the city, and yet somehow the city had been delayed. Year after year, decade after decade, the capital city of Jerusalem, the temple is there, but the city is in ruins. The walls are in rubble, and the city is not populated. The houses are not yet rebuilt. And for 70 years until Nehemiah shows up and then the walls are restored and then after all these years, life in the city can finally get moving forward. The homes can now be rebuilt. It's safe inside those walls. The businesses can get rolling along. The uh, education and trade and community life can finally get rolling and the children can fill the streets again. 
And so they gather as one man, it says, as a, a large group to honor the Lord and to hear from the Lord and to celebrate before the Lord. They are finally home in the capital city. And Ezra steps up to this special podium, this pulpit that's high above the people so that his voice can project out over that crowd built specifically for this occasion. And he looks across that crowd, and if you can try to imagine being there, and, and all he can get out as you read the text is initially, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. It's a church service like probably none of us have ever experienced. As I was thinking about it this week, I'm like, have you ever been in an environment like what is described here? And the closest thing that I could remember in my memory banks was July 4th, 2021, just three years ago, and not because it was the 4th of July, American Independence Day. If you remember, that was the first Sunday of full opening of services after COVID. And for months, 16 months, we had been meeting in every possible imaginable way, online primarily in groups of 50, outdoors under tents, in this room with plexiglass dividers down the sides so 50 could sit in all the sections. We'd figured out a way in 16 services that we could welcome 800 people, but the majority still had to stay at home and watch online. And July 1st, all the restrictions were lifted. And I don't know how many of you were there that weekend. But that Sunday, there was a palpable sense of joy and celebration in this place. And we sang the song, there is joy in the house of the Lord. And I have never heard our congregation sing like that. And there were so many people who commented after that weekend, it was like a taste of heaven. I heard so many say that. So the question is, why did it take a pandemic to make us hungry for God? Why did it take months of being locked out for us to crave the fellowship of God's people? And is there a way of maintaining that desire to gather and the desire to worship and the desire to be under the word of God and with his people, the desire to return Christ and church to the center of our lives? Is there a way to maintain it in the ordinary rhythms of life? And so our text is very, very basic. In fact, we might organize it simply around that statement, back to the basics, because what we see in this story is back to the basics of worship and the word of, of Bible and prayer, of course, back to the basics of study and action and instruction, back to the basics of awe and wonder, of humility and repentance, and, and then of joy and fellowship and quiet strength, back to the rhythms of worship, the sacrificial system, the, the festivals and the feasts, the Sabbath celebrations with your own family and with God's family. And so let's just walk back through it really quickly and look at it under that theme of back to the basics of, of worship and the word. The first thing that we see in the, the context is so clear, these people are eager they're hungry on this day to hear the word of the Lord. It, it's quite interesting. The walls are finished and, and they need to have a party. They need to have a dedication. They need to celebrate and they, they gather together. But did you notice what it said there in chapter eight, verse one? We read it earlier. They gathered as one man into the square and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law. Now that's kind of a funny comment. Hey preacher, remember to bring your Bible. We're gathered for a celebration. We don't necessarily care what you think, Ezra. We want to hear the word of the Lord. Bring the book, Ezra. What we need more than anything else today is to hear from the Lord. And it was a scripture reading like most of us have never experienced. From early morning until noonday heat, Ezra stands to read. And the moment he starts reading, they stood to their feet. They didn't sit like you people. They stood to their feet. Chapter 8, verse 3, and he read from it from early morning until midday. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So that's how the morning went. But then verse 5 circles back around, and it goes back to the top of the morning to tell us how it started. Nehemiah 8, 5, and 6, Ezra opened the book. And he blessed the Lord, and the people answered him, amen, amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped 
the Lord. What's very interesting is before Ezra can even get started, all he says is praise the Lord, bless the Lord. And the praise starts happening. So I'm reading a little book, a bit of a commentary on Ezra and Nehemiah, but set in an interesting way. This little book, Renewing the City, it's, it's in sort of a historical narrative. It takes the scripture and he puts the conversations into place and then he wraps it around urban renewal in our day. It's quite an interesting little read, but I like the section how he puts this little story here. And and let me just read a paragraph that when Ezra reached the wooden structure and climbed the stairs to the platform, a hush fell over the crowd. One of his assistants handed him a scroll, and with great reverence, he gently unrolled it and held it high for all to see. The entire assembly spontaneously rose to their feet, some with eyes turned heavenward and others with their heads bowed. The sight was more than the old scribe was prepared for, and all that would come forth from his mouth was an emotion-choked, praise God. And like sparks from a campfire, words of praise broke out across the assembly. And soon the whole plaza was caught up in a spirit of worship. Amen, amen, the people responded. Women began waving their hands with shouts of Hosanna. And others bowed low to the ground, even some prostrating themselves before the Lord. It was the kind of spirit-ignited worship that no priest could plan or control. A rekindling of the soul of a people who had grown cold with worldly cares. And finally, when the crowd got quiet and Ezra regained his composure, he began to read aloud from the law. I like how he puts it. You place yourself in that story and you're like, what was that like? No ordinary worship gathering. It was an extraordinary moment in time and history. They were hungry for God. God was taking them back to the basics, the basics of study and action and instruction. So when Ezra is introduced to us, back in the book of Ezra, it says this in chapter 7, verse 10, Ezra set his heart to study the law of the Lord, to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. To study, to do, and to teach. That was Ezra's assignment. Study, do, and teach. In Nehemiah's account, we're told that Ezra reads and then he pauses That the Levites circulate out through the crowds, and it says in verse 7 and 8, the Levites help the people understand. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and gave the sense. You don't understand what you're reading? Let's get in a little circle hill and huddle up, and we'll tell you what it means. So that the people understood the reading. You see, the renewal of the nation of Israel, and frankly, the renewal of Canada, will require a return to the basics. And we've got to ask ourselves a question of whether we will hear and study and apply and teach the word of God. In other words, will it be enough for us to just hear the word, to sit under the word, or will we do it? Will we understand it? Will we apply it? Will we teach it? Will our hearts be warmed and stirred to worship? That's great. That's step one. Do we understand what we're hearing and reading? But step two is this. Does it translate into a changed life, into changed attitudes, changed actions? Uh, New Testament, Jesus says this, Matthew 7. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And In other words, what Jesus says, build your life on this book. Build your life uh, according to my law, according to my commands, according to my great love and mercy. Make your decisions based on this book. Fashion your life around this book. And when the Storms of life crash up against you, and they will, because every life has storms crashing against it. Your foundation will hold if it's built on the rock. Not just knowing the word, but actually obeying it and living it out. And so as we'll read in the coming weeks in this context, there are two great challenges for these folks, and we're going to come back to them. Their two greatest challenges were their marriages and their finance. Two of the basic building blocks of our lives, sex and money. That if our marriages are weak, if our families are weak, if the parent-child relationships are weak, if the family unit is not strong, if our sexual ethic is being driven along by the culture, by the, the idols of the cultures around us, the sea of confusion. And if we haven't learned that we can trust God. 
that we can trust God to be our supply and our keeper, that we can give generously because he is our provider, then our spiritual life will be poorer on both accounts. We'll get there in a couple weeks. Won't tell you which weekend's what because you might not come. (laughs) Back to the basics of worship and the word, joyful study, action, and instruction. I like how Eugene Peterson summarizes Ezra's life. He says, the people of God identity. The people of God identity, that's who we are. The people of God identity was recovered and preserved. Ezra used worship and text to do it. He engaged them in the worship of God, the most all-absorbing, comprehensive act in which men and women can engage. This is how our God-formed identities become most deeply embedded in us. And Ezra led them into an obedient listening to the text of Scripture. And so have we taken for granted how critical the rhythms of our worship, the rhythms of the word, our That as the word is read and explained, that there was a palpable sense of awe and wonder, of humility and repentance, and of joy and fellowship and quiet strength. And so what we see first is we've already looked at the spontaneous outbreak of praise and worship, but then we see their humility and their tears as the word of the Lord starts to sink in. The, The word of the Lord is read and it comes with gravitas and with conviction. Now, we're not told precisely what section of the law Ezra was reading, but whatever he was reading, it cut to their heart. And the people were struck with the holiness of God and immediately contrasted with their sin-soiled lives and the tears began to flow. And so if you look at chapter eight, verse nine, and Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught all the people, said to the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Don't mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. As they heard God's word and they're like, how could I have drifted so far away from the lover of my soul? How could I have ever walked away from my faith and trust? Oh God. Oh God, you have been so faithful. You have been so good. Oh God, can you forgive Oh, God, can you restore? And then it's almost like a whiplash response when you read forward because Nehemiah now grabs the microphone. And in a few sentences, he changes the tone entirely. Verse 10 to 12, then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, be quiet, for this day is holy. Don't be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Stop your weeping. Interesting. Because tears are a very, very important part of our spiritual journey. Brokenness for our sin has to happen before restoration, but in this context, Nehemiah is like, today is not so much focused on our sinfulness, but today is focused on the beauty and the holiness and the grace of our God. Today is not the day to be looking inward at your sin. Today is to be today looking upward into the face of your God. Today is a day of joy and celebration. God has and is restoring us. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And it's been a long morning, folks. I hope you brought your lunch because it's time to break out the food. It's potluck dinner time. And if anyone doesn't have something, if some folks didn't bring some along, share what you've got with the people around you. Make sure everybody's got something. Go on now, verse 10, eat the fat and drink the wine and share with those who didn't bring anything with them. This day is holy to our God. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Dry up your tears, get your eyes on the goodness of your God. So that's the story. A day of revival and a day of renewal. And there's a lot more to say, and we'll get to it later. Nehemiah doesn't hold back. He challenges these people in the days to come. The the reason we're in this mess is because of our own unfaithfulness. But today is a day to give thanks to God. And so you pull up out of the particulars of Nehemiah 8, and you remind yourself of the overarching storyline 
that God was restoring his people to worship in the word, to the centrality of temple worship, to the hope of the atoning work of God, to the heart of worship in the nation, and that it would be ignited again by getting back to the basics. So I told you week one that the reason that we're looking at this theme right now, in part at least, two or three things. In part because we're getting ready to build a a newer building out here. There's going to be a hole behind us soon, we hope. And I've had some people ask me the question, why are you doing this? Uh, Don't you know the statistics? Don't you know that the church in North America is declining? Don't you know that churches are closing their doors? What are you thinking? Why are you building? We are building because we believe Jesus promised to be true, that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We're building because as long as there are lost people in Abbotsford and Mission, we still have work to do. As long as we have the freedom in this great land of ours, as long as the freedom is ours to gather publicly, we are going to do it every week as we press forward. The second motivation for this series is simply that bigger picture. That the North American church is in decline and it is in desperate need of renewal and awakening and revival. And and Pastor Jeff, years ago when we first started talking about this, talked about this building gives us a bigger engine, if you will. It gives us a bigger engine to fan into flame, more disciples, more leaders, more churches. And as our nation needs better pastors and better churches, we want to be part of raising them up. That's part of the reason. But third and most critical is if we're going to see the renewal of our nation, we're in this series because we got to remind ourselves it begins with us. And that long before we ever start critiquing the craziness of the culture around us, long before we start deconstructing everything that the wacko people out there in the world are doing, the scripture calls us to look in the mirror. Psalm 139. Search me, O God. And know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any grievous way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. Sounds an awful lot like 2 Chronicles 7. If my people call by my name, humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. We need to return to a Christ-centered daily life and to a church-centered rhythm. So let me remind you, praise God, that we are New Testament Christians. Uh, Just let me remind you of that. Because what we see restored here, the Old Testament rhythms of sacrifice and festivals were inadequate to satisfy the wrath of a holy God. The book of Hebrews in particular compares and contrasts the Old Covenant to the New Covenant and how those sacrifices that these people were offering would only cover over sin for a period of time and it is why the Old Testament priest's work was never, ever done. That even on the highest and most holy day of the year, the Day of Atonement, the people knew that the holiest man on earth, the high priest, would enter into the holiest place on earth, the holy of holies, and he would offer the the holiest sacrifice on earth, the blood of a spotless lamb, and they they knew that the, the sins would be placed on the other goat, and he would be sent out to the wilderness, the scapegoat, but the priest knew and the people knew that the moment that that year's sins were atoned for, that the ledger sheet of sins for next year was already starting to pile up. The blood of goats and bulls could never take away our sin. And so we fast forward to the New Testament. That God in eternity past made a plan, an audacious plan, that God said, I'll go down there myself. I'm going to take the sins of the world on myself. I will enter time and history and live as a man, Jesus Christ, living the sinless life you and I could not live. And then Jesus Christ, the perfect sinless Lamb of God, willingly walking the road to Calvary to lay that life down, not for his sin, but for mine and for yours. 
And then he cried out in that moment from the cross, his arms stretched out, it is finished. And in part, what he had to have meant is the Old Testament sacrificial system can stop now because the wrath of God has been satisfied. The mediator of a new covenant is standing in our midst. The once for all sacrifice of Jesus has been declared satisfactory. It is finished. Amen. And then Hebrews unpacks that in great detail and then summarizes in chapter 10, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Three really quick things. We've got confidence to walk right into the presence of a holy God because we are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We have an unwavering confidence that the one who made this promise is faithful. It is not our work, it is his work. He started it, he will complete it. We just cling to Jesus and he's gonna finish his work. And finally, what is that first maybe not an immediate application to the cross? You look at this and go, how do you connect this directly to the cross and yet the author of Hebrews does. The final thing is, and by the way, we don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Why? Why do we not give up meeting? Because we know that left to ourselves, we drift. Left to ourselves, we walk away. And we need our eyes lifted, and so we gather to recenter our lives on Jesus Christ. And so the question I ask you at the start, can a Christian flourish in their Christian journey without being part of a local church fellowship? And my answer is no. Now, you might want to argue with me, but it's okay. One of us will be wrong. Can a Christian flourish without the fellowship of the body of Christ? Can a Christian flourish without the basics, the rhythms, the reminders that Jesus did all that needed to be done week in and week out, reminding us that whether it's a great week or a hell of a week, that Jesus did everything that needed to be done. And I need that recentering. So Patrick was an English kid. He was kidnapped and dragged across the ocean to Ireland as a slave. Eventually, he escapes some years later and goes home to England, and the Spirit of God grabs hold of him and says, you need to go back to the Green Island as a missionary this time. Go back to your captors and take them the gospel of Jesus. And so he spent his life on that beautiful island. He rallied people around the gospel of Jesus and the evangelization of that Green Island called Ireland and the building of over a hundred chapels are credited to this one man, Patrick. And one of his most famous prayers has been passed down through the centuries because he knew his people had to be daily centered on Jesus Christ if they were going to survive. And so he taught them prayers. This is how you armor yourself up for the daily battle. From the time you crawl out of bed in the morning until you lay your head at night, remind yourself of who you are in Christ. And, and his most famous prayer, Patrick's breastplate, the breastplate of righteousness, Ephesians 6 says, and it goes like this. I rise today in the power of Christ's birth and baptism, in the power of his crucifixion and burial, in the power of his rising and ascending, in the power of his descending and judging. I rise today with the power of God to pilot me. God's strength to sustain me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look ahead for me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to protect me, God's way before me, God's shield to defend me, God's host to deliver me. 
from the snares of devil, from evil temptations, from nature's failing, from all who wish to harm me far or near, alone and in a crowd, I rise today in the power of Christ. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ within me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ to the right of me, Christ to the left of me, Christ in my lying, Christ in my sitting, Christ in my rising, Christ in the heart of all who think of me, Christ on the tongue of all who speak to me, Christ in the eye of all who see me, Christ in the ear of all who hear me. I rise today in the power of Christ. So it's a pretty basic message, but I believe it is one we desperately need. Our nation and our churches and each of us as individuals need to keep Christ and church at the center of our lives because God, when he sets out to renew his people, takes them back to the basics. So would you stand with me? I want to pray for you. We'll sing. Be on our way. Oh, Lord Jesus, you are so good. Father, you are so good to us. Holy Spirit, you are so good to us. So, Father, you've given us the rhythms. Seven days, and you set aside one to spend time in worship and with our families, rejoicing in the goodness of God. Daily, you put your word in front of us. And Holy Spirit, you open it so that we can understand it and we can apply it. Father, you supply everything that we need. You give us most of all, and most importantly, salvation. You do for us what we can't do for ourselves. You reconcile us to God the Father through your sinless life. But beyond that, Lord, you look after us. You provide for us financially. You provide for us in healing our bodies. You provide for us in bringing reconciliation and restoration when we harm one another. Oh God, you have been so good to us. Would you fan into flame the work of your spirit? Would you bring revival, Lord? And would you begin with us? We ask in Jesus' name, amen.